Congratulations. Now it's time for our chairman's remarks tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very difficult speech to give because it involves an introspective look at our own party and what I see are some very disturbing truths. They're so disturbing, in fact, that I consider not continuing as your chairman. I have, however, chosen a different path. Instead, I decided to share my thoughts and convictions, which are that we must chart a new course for our party, our communities, our state, and our nation. These are the times that try men's souls. Tonight, we should all fear for our country. While we don't face the guns, death, and sacrifice that confronted our forefathers, we face something far more insidious, a decay and destruction of our liberties. This decay comes from an enemy within, which makes it difficult to confront. Unfortunately, this decay comes, in part, from Republicans who have played a significant role in the advancement of a progressive agenda in this country. The decay is eroding our most fundamental values and must be stopped. Our state is severely broken. We face a badly damaged country run by political parties, unions, and corporations that are stealing any hope of a bright future from our children. But we don't despair. In all things, we have choices. It was 46 years ago, citizen Ronald Reagan delivered a speech about choices. In that speech, he spoke of excessive federal spending, of whether we believe in self-governance. He spoke of whether elitists in a distant capital can plan our lives better than we can. He spoke of everything we are facing today. His speech was entitled, A Time for Choosing. In the face of some very disturbing issues, and a generation later, we now face our own time for choosing. Our country is $13 trillion in debt. We will add $1 trillion in new debt each year in the foreseeable future. <clears throat> Worse yet, there are no consequences for failure. We have a bailout, a loan, or a stimulus package for anything that meets or that fails to meet the standard of the free market. We're the most irresponsible generation this country has ever known, with nearly $120 trillion in debt and unfunded liabilities for Social Security and Medicare. This is $400,000 for every one of you here tonight, and $400,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. How do we explain or defend this? particularly to those who had no part in the creation of these obligations. Sadly, our generation is creating indentured servants of our children and of children yet to be born. We make no sacrifices and take no responsibility. We only consume and borrow and then consume more. We're the first generation in the history of this country that has actually decided to not sacrifice on behalf of future generations. This is unconscionable and immoral. In contrast, my grandfather was part of the greatest generation. He was frugal. He never asked for anything. He never bragged about anything. Yet he had so much to brag about. He was a decorated World War II veteran. He was at the invasion of Normandy. He was at the Battle of the Bulge where 19,000 fellow American soldiers died. He did tours of duty throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. He bled for our country, and he walked away with numerous commendations, a bronze star, a purple heart. I learned of his heroics only after his death, when he was 86. I asked my grandmother why she never told me. Her response was that she never knew. You see, my grandfather believed that service to his country was a duty to be performed and nothing to be talked about or bragged about. 
How is it that his generation was so great and we've become so selfish, narcissistic, and dependent? Our 50 states are in no better shape with $2 trillion in unfunded pension liabilities. Why? Because we allow public employees to retire at 50 or 55 with a $100,000 pension, a $200,000 pension, a $250,000 pension, guaranteed for life. And with trillions of dollars in bonded indebtedness, we have several states flirting with bankruptcy. California is leading the charge. We have a half a trillion dollars in debt right here in California. And we're still asking for more. You would think that running up this massive debt, our politicians would stop spending and living beyond our means. But they don't. They are addicted to power and spending. They will say and do anything to keep feeding their addictions. How often do you hear a politician say that he or she is fiscally prudent, and then they turn around and vote on more spending? This is not to say that all politicians are bad. We have many honorable elected representatives and patriots serving in Washington and Sacramento today. I do mean to say, however, that the spending addictions that we see in Washington, Sacramento, and cities throughout Orange County know no party affiliation. Many Republicans have been just as guilty as Democrats. In point of fact, under George Bush's presidency, with a Republican Congress for six of those years, our government grew, entitlements expanded, and our national debt was nearly doubled. This is a very inconvenient truth for Republicans. And this is precisely why a recent Rasmussen poll revealed that 75% of Republican voters believe that elected Republicans are out of touch. In defense of their spending, I often hear Republicans say that we just need to understand that their votes represent the best deal they could get. I know. I've been there before. When I was in the legislature, I too cast some bad votes. Confession of a bad vote is healthy and redeeming. But to simply say we don't understand is condescending to the people who vote them into office. I don't need to understand your votes if my liberties are reduced while progressive policies are advanced. Elected representatives are public servants. They are not public masters. The problem is that they too often have become isolated from their constituents. Yet in their arrogance and in the intoxication of capital politics, they claim they know what's best for their constituents. It is time they represented we the people and stop pursuing their self-interest with preservation of their public office being their top priority. Unfortunately, I'm speaking to our Central Committee here tonight. We as party officials share in the blame because we fail to confront the duplicity of Republicans who claim to be for limited government and then vote for ballooning debts and increased spending. This is, the question we have tonight is whether we have the resolve to change the status quo. As a country, we've been here before and we know what to do. After King George passed the T Act of 1773, the American colonists had a little party. They dumped 342 chests of tea into the sea. In response, King George passed the Coercive Acts of 1774. These Coercive Acts were dubbed the Intolerable Acts by the Colonists. And they led to the first American Revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, just look to our nation's capital. The $800 billion stimulus bill that no one read the health care bill that Americans do not want and the cap and trade bill that we cannot afford are the intolerable acts of our day. And if you are ready, it's time for a second American Revolution.
Thomas Jefferson said, when governments fear the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. You need to know that your government and most of your elected representatives do not fear you tonight. That's why they don't even flinch when they vote for the intolerable acts of our day, like the failed stimulus package and the certain to fail health care package. Our second American revolution can only succeed, however, if it obtains its energy from leaders like you here tonight. We cannot count on a Republican elected leadership. That's a difficult thing to say. I don't hear from them that they want a revolution. I don't hear from them that they want to restore our liberties. I only hear they want their power back. What will they do with it? I don't just want Republicans back in power. I want Republicans who are reformers back in power. simply because Democrats have failed in their social experiments is not good enough. What have we accomplished if Democrats and Republicans trade seats every few years while we continue on a path of irreversible decline? In case you're confused, let me be very clear about Democrats. I don't want Democrats in power at all. Democrats in Washington today, from the President down to the members of Congress, are engaged in a wholesale change of the American landscape that is designed to permanently eliminate our liberty in exchange for their ideal view of the world. Here in California, we're dominated by a coalition of liberals who engage in rank hypocrisy in the pursuit of their utopian world. They claim they're business friendly while they heap taxes and regulations that drive business out of this state. They claim they want affordable housing while they prevent new construction with environmental terrorism. They claim they want money for the blind, the disabled, and for our school children. Yet they routinely bestow more benefits on public employees that are draining our coffers. Unfortunately, as bad as these democratic policies are, we have higher taxes and more debt today because year after year, Republicans provide the marginal vote to make it happen. This unholy alliance is destroying our state and our country. Moreover, it undermines our justification as a party to gain public support. It is this very real threat to our liberties by this coalition of liberals and accommodating Republicans that makes it imperative for us to clean up our own house, restore our credibility with the voters, and put this country back on a path of self-reliance and self-government. What good is a Big Ten if the tin is so big that it collapses the very principles that we hold dear? While making observations about a house divided against itself, Abigail Adams stated in 1812, upon that foundation do our enemies build their hopes of subduing us. We need to understand the proper purpose of a political party. The purpose is not the raw accumulation of power and technical majorities. The purpose is to gain a majority and implement the policies articulated in our platform. This is important. We in this party, and in party organizations throughout this country, will only succeed if we fundamentally change the relationship between the members of our Central Committee and the candidates and office holders that we support. We can no longer support a paradigm where we automatically support the product and endorse the product, but have no say in the condition or the quality of that product. We no longer have the luxury.
luxury of merely registering voters and getting them out to vote. This is unsustainable, and with your help, this ends tonight. Your call to action tonight is to meet with your local, state, and federal elected representatives. Your call to action is to challenge your representatives when they stray from the path of limited government. Your call to action, quite simply, is to hold them accountable to the limited government platforms upon which they ran. So whether the elected Republican is in Washington chasing pork laden earmarks that lack transparency and voting for a greater role in government, or whether they're in Sacramento voting for increased taxes and bloated bonds like the water bond and stem cell research, or whether you're right here in Orange County voting for outrageous public employee benefits, you will no longer find automatic sanctuary in this party. We will hold you accountable, and your protection ends tonight. slick consultants and cashed in on your friendships in this body. The standard will be whether you have a proven commitment to limited government, because I'm tired of politicians who campaign based on the advice of consultants rather than the convictions of their hearts. Yes. who have no vision for liberty and no unqualified commitment to its protection. I'm tired of politicians who want to only occupy a seat of power but do nothing to advance the cause of liberty. I'm going to give you an example. Rhetoric is interesting, but examples are important. I don't want to see Republicans in this county voting the so-called right way on the pension reform that's coming down the path. I want to see Republicans taking political risk by offering proactive solutions that, including, that include creating two or three tier pension systems that would allow us to get our books back in order. That's a tough call. Do you know why? For our electives, it's risky. It takes political courage because tonight, unions across this county are threatening local elected officials who dare to walk down that path. This must end tonight. We must protect the people who will stand up for pension reform so we can get our, backs in order, our books back in order and reject the union thuggery that we see all over this county. For the rest of us, we must return to the concept of sacrifice as embodied by our founding fathers and carried on by generations that follow. I'm not talking about the sacrifice of wounds, loss of limb, and death that so many of our honored men and women endured in the defense of this country. For most of us, this is not the type of sacrifice that we face. But we do owe it to these brave soldiers to honor their sacrifice by giving up some of our comforts, some of our securities, in order to leave a better and stronger nation for future generations. We can honor their sacrifice by giving resources that we have. For some of us, it's money. For many of us, it's time stuffing envelopes, walking precincts, making telephone calls. But we need more than your time and money. We need your talent, your ideas, your solutions. We need your technology. We need your communication skills. Whatever your asset is, we need you to engage tonight and measure your sacrifice in this second American revolution. In addition to our duties as Central Committee members, I'm asking you to tonight, tonight to decide if you have a calling for public office. There will be no incumbent protected who is not like-minded in the spirit and word of this speech tonight. As chairman of this party, the doors are open. Will you walk through them? 
The reason I, that I ask you to walk through these doors is because even here in conservative Orange County, electing people with an R behind their name has not always yielded freedom-based outcomes. There is no clear illustration of this in the abuses we've seen with public employee unions. Most of you tonight are not offered a pension plan at all. Some of you may have an employer that contributes in a range of 3 to 5 percent. A very generous employer can contribute maybe 15 percent. I've heard of them going as high as 25, but it's extremely rare. Compare your situation tonight with the public safety workers of Orange County. You, the taxpayer, are currently contributing 51% of their payroll into the pension. If you think it's bad, in 2014, the contribution will be an astounding 84% of payroll. Just to illustrate, if you weren't quick at that math, if someone's making $100,000 today, you, the taxpayer, will have to contribute an additional $84,000 just to cover the cost of their pension. It's no surprise that Democrat Willie Brown, the former Speaker of the Legislature and former Mayor of San Francisco, some would say a liberal, <laughs> recently stated, at some point, someone is going to have to get honest about the fact that 80% of the state County and city budget deficits in California are due to employee costs. Ladies and gentlemen, that time is now. So taking a moment to be specific about what we can be, do here locally to address this imbalance, I'm proposing for this Central Committee a couple of minimum standards for candidates in order to obtain support from our party. First, no candidate will be supported by this party who does not endorse and help pass the Paycheck Protection Initiative. Yes. Also known as yes. also known as the Citizens Power Initiative, and you'll hear more about that tonight from our guest Mark Meckler. The Paycheck Protection Initiative is a policy rooted in freedom. It will not in and of itself solve our problems in Sacramento, but it will cut the money flow off that creates such imbalances in the way Sacramento operates. Millions of dollars that union bosses spend each year on initiatives and candidate support are nothing more than stolen money from the rank and file. Whenever the union bosses need more money for their agenda, they don't ask the employees if they'll contribute. No, they simply deduct it from their paychecks. Thomas Jefferson said, to compel a man to furnish funds for the propagation of ideas he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. With your help tonight, we can end this tyrannical practice. The second item I want to propose tonight as a minimum standard for support is that from this night forward, no candidate will be supported by this party who receives contributions and endorsements from public employee unions. taking their money, we're not asking you to give it back, but we will take a look at you with a healthy dose of skepticism. This proposed prohibition would not apply to contributions voluntarily donated by individual union members. You see, union members are honorable, hardworking, and decent. It's the unions themselves and their empires that have a stranglehold on our political systems. I realize it's possible to take union money and vote against their relentless pursuit of the public purse, but far too many of our elected officials have taken their money or endorsements and then voted with the union job bosses. Occasionally a bright line is necessary in order to restore balance. 
In the coming months, we as a Central Committee can work on other ideas and standards for local, state, and federal offices that will help put us on the right path. But in the meantime, and in closing, I want you to see that the abuses in our local, state, and federal governments are far too great to ignore. They are leading to our demise as a country. On April 19, 1775, a small group of 77 alarmed citizens fought the first battle of the American Revolution in the fields of Lexington and Concord in the state of Massachusetts. 235 years later, the first battle of the second American Revolution will be fought in that same state. Tomorrow, the same formerly held by Ted Kennedy. <laughs> An unknown, underfunded underdog, Scott Brown has shaken the foundation of every liberal Democrat in that state by threatening to do the impossible, taking the so-called Kennedy seat away from them. I think he meant Brown. Folks, those daring 77 patriots did not win the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Like Scott Brown, they faced overwhelming odds. 700 British soldiers and 1,700 reinforcements. But the patriots gave them a beating that was only a sign of things to come, for it was the shot heard around the world. Tonight, I want to take you back to the beginning of my remarks and refer you once again to the indelible words of Thomas Paine. Listen carefully. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. So tonight, I ask you, what will your role be in the Second American Revolution? <clears throat> will you be a summer soldier? A sunshine patriot? Or will you give sacrificially in order to restore this country to freedom? Let's move forward together.